church. Great to see all of you guys today. I, I don't know. I, I say it every single week. Great to see you. Well, ho hopefully I will be able to see your faces, many of your faces very, very soon. Um, but I'm glad to be with you guys this morning. This morning is such a, a good and important morning together. We're participating in communion. So make sure you have that ready to go right at the end of my message. We'll be taking a time to share in communion. And um, I am, uh, I, I, I have a message on my heart today for you guys that, that, that I really felt the Lord wanted me to talk about. And, and it's something that has really been, been, been strong in my thoughts and in my heart over the last few weeks and, and, and something that God has been speaking uh, to, to different ones of us. Uh, he's spoken to Pastor Evelyn, my wife, um, and, and she actually shared about this a few days ago on YouTube, and it's this, fear. I want to talk about fear today. I, I, I really do feel and believe that this is a season where the enemy is using fear to keep people down. And, and I want to specifically address fear and, and, and what it does to us and, and what our answer is to the fears that plague our lives. And so today I want to talk about facing your fear, how to face your fear. And I believe that you can. Our human tendency when, when fears come is to uh, either, you know, run away or to freeze in fear or to, you know, or, or to try to fight against it. But, but there's even a, a greater answer that I believe that God gives to us regarding what to do with our fear. And so I want to talk to you about that today. And, and, and really, I, I've noticed that a lot of people are afraid of a lot lot of things right now. And it's not just the personal fears, right? You know, some of you are afraid of spiders and others are afraid of heights and, and, and other types of things. But, but the reality is that in most of those personal types of fears, we can kind of get away with managing our lives while we have those fears, right? You know, if you're afraid of heights, well, then you, you know, kind of stay away from heights. And if you're uh, afraid of spiders, well, then you find somebody else to kill it for you when it shows up in the house. So, you know, don't live alone, I guess. And, uh, but, but those individual types of fears are fears that most of the time in a lot of ways we're able to deal with. And some of them, uh, some of them cause us low amounts of difficulty. Others cause higher amounts of difficulty, but, but I, I don't want to talk about those fears today. I want to talk about some of the bigger fears that are going on. Let me, let me address what's really happening right now, right? People are afraid of COVID and they're afraid that they're going to get sick and people are afraid they're going to get sick and they're going to die. That's a very real fear. People are afraid of the school situation. Some people are afraid of their kids going back to school. Other people are afraid of their kids not going to school. People are afraid of the work situation. Will I still have a job? Will I be able to get a job? How is it going to affect my life if my kids are at home from school, but I have to go to work and I'm a single parent or we're married and we both work and then our kids are at home. And then what do we do with them? And, and, and there are all these fears that people have. And let me be clear it's, it, it's really important to be people that are wise and, and take precautions. That, that's absolutely important. But what I am beginning to see more and more is people that have crossed the line of caution and moved into the territory of fear. And that's actually a very thin line, right? It's a very, very thin line. Where, where people, for example, believe if, if I wear a mask, then I want you to track with me here, right? I'm not making any political statements or anything like that. But if I wear a mask, I'm going to be fully protected. And so then we come to depend on the mask. Watch what happens. Masks are good. They provide good protection. That's fine. But then what happens when the mask turns into your source of comfort? It turns into your source of feeling like I don't need to be afraid anymore. You know, God should be the one that brings comfort to our souls. 
And in the midst of a world that seems to be changing daily in so many different types of ways, and then the fears that come upon us, right? And, 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 and what fear is, is it's completely irrational, right? It's, it's, I, I, I've heard people, I've seen people go, yeah, I'll, I'll go to work and I'll go to the store and I'll maybe even hang out with a couple friends, but ah, I, I, I won't go to a church meeting because I'm afraid. And, and you go, wait a minute. You, you do all the other things. Well, I have to do those things. Well, I would encourage you that if you and I are followers of Jesus Christ, we have to follow the word and what God has called us to do. And yeah, I'm being very specific right now, but I'm not talking about how you deal with one issue or another issue. What I want to talk about today is not allowing fear to drive your life. Who is at the wheel of your vehicle, of your car? Is it fear driving it or is Jesus driving you. And let me make clear before I go on, I'm not talking against taking precautions and doing the things that we need to do. I fully believe in those things and have no problem with them. But I have noticed many, many, many people being driven by fear in this season rather than being driven by faith in Jesus Christ. We have a God who heals the sick. We have a God who provides miraculously. We have a God who does things that go beyond anything we can imagine. Yet we cower in fear at the assaults that are happening in our lives, the difficulties that come at us. And so I want to share with you today from Psalm chapter 46. And Psalm 46 is a, is a great, great Psalm and one that I believe has a lot to say to each and every one of us. And so I'm just going to jump right into this. I'm going to read the whole Psalm to you. And, and there's a couple parts that I want to point out to you guys today. Start saying this, God is our refuge and strength. Always ready to help in times of trouble. God is our refuge. He is our place of protection. He is our strength. He's the one that we go to when everything is going crazy. God is our refuge and strength. Always ready to help. Did you see that? Always ready to help. God is always ready to help. You know, what are you putting or where are you placing your life would be a better way to say it. What is the refuge that you are seeking out? You know, so often we seek, whether it be finances to be our refuge or, 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 or staying at home to be our refuge or the mask to be our refuge or, you know, school for the kids to be the refuge or not going to school and them staying home to be the refuge. And, and we're looking for things to be our refuge when God makes it really clear. Allow him to be your refuge. Allow him to be your strength. Because what happens is when we begin to take refuge in our own devices and, and, and when fear happens, let me be clear. What we try to do is we try to control everything, right? We try to control the environment. I, I'm going to, I'm going to manage this and I'm going to keep this and I'm going to keep these people away. And I'm going to make sure that everything happens exactly as I need it to happen because I'm afraid of what might go wrong. And so I'm going to just, just protect and, and create the perfect environment. I'm sorry to inform you, but it is impossible to control your environment perfectly. It's impossible. What happens when things go wrong? What happens if you get exposed and you weren't planning on it? What happens when things don't go the way that you were planning on them to go? What do we do? And fear causes us to control. And then the more we try to control our environment, listen to this, the less connection we have with God and the less connection we have with other people. And that is actually much more dangerous than any sickness could ever cause you. 
the, the, the disconnection from people. I, I, I mentioned this last week. We have seen more people with mental health issues, more people, more young people committing suicide than ever before because fear has caused us into a place of being disconnected from others in relationship. And it's now caused a whole other set of problems and difficulties and death as well. Fear is never a healthy way to live our lives. But would you allow God to be your refuge, to be the one that you depend on? You see, I I was thinking about this because what, what, what happens with fear and what happens with our sense of control is it takes up so much mental, emotional, and physical energy that the, we then do not have the energy to invest in engaging God and engaging others in our lives. Fear isolates us. It takes up all of our brain power, all of our emotional strength, all of our physical energy, and then we have nothing left to give and nothing left to engage with. And I wanna encourage you today that Jesus is your refuge. Take precautions in life, yes, but release your fear, release your need to control and trust in God and you will see what he is going to do. You know, again, this reminds me of of kind of a a prophetic insight that God gave to Pastor Evelyn. And if you want to check it out, go to the City Life YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash City Life LA, prayer from Wednesday of this last week. Okay, prayer from Wednesday. Look at it in the morning, Pastor Evelyn leads it, and close to the end of the prayer time, she talks about this prophetic insight that God gave her regarding what fear is doing to people and how people are actually getting sick because of fear. They're getting sick because of fear. And we know, we know even scientifically this is true, that emotional states like fear literally can lower your immune system and cause you to be in a place where you are more susceptible to sickness. And so even if you control the environment in your life, if one little thing gets in, if one little thing goes wrong, you can actually be more susceptible to sickness because of the fear that exists inside of your life. And I believe God wants to remove fear from us in this period of time. Watch verse two and what is said. They say this, because God right is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. We will not fear. We will not fear. We will not fear when earthquakes come, when the mountains crumble into the sea, when the oceans roar and foam and the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Or in other words, when the mountains are thrown into the sea, when big things happen in the world, it doesn't matter if there's sickness in the world, if there's riots in the world, whatever. When big things go on, they say, we will not fear. How many of you felt the earthquake? this last week. Did you feel it? You know, um, hey, I was in bed. I, uh, yeah, I was during, you know, sleep time. So I, I was in bed. Evelyn was right next to me. And, and, and I think I felt maybe, maybe two seconds of it. I don't even know how long it lasted. And, and I really kind of woke up because um, Evelyn touched me and, and was like, hey, hey, did you feel that? And, and I'm there half asleep and I'm going, yeah, I, 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 I think I felt it. And then I just fell asleep again because you know what? That, that was it. I, 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 I felt it. I was like, yeah, I think an earthquake just happened. I'm tired. Let me go back to sleep. You know, and, and I love what, what they're saying here. They is in the descendants of Korah who wrote this song. They're saying, we will not fear. Let earthquakes come. Let mountains crumble into the sea, be thrown into the sea. Let the oceans go crazy and we will not be afraid. I want to talk to you about this word fear right here. Because this word fear can be taken one of two ways in scripture. One of the ways that this word is taken is when it's talking about fearing God. And it means honor, to honor, to respect God, right? But it's used in other ways to be afraid of something, right? You know, like 
like this, like when oceans roar and mountains crumble and earthquakes happen and COVID strikes, right? To, to be afraid of those things. And they're literally saying, we will not fear. But, but I want to I wanna give you a, a perspective here that I believe will actually help you today. You see, they're saying, obviously, we will not be afraid of those things, right? God is our refuge, so we won't be afraid of those things. But if you would take what that word means towards God, to honor God, to respect God, they're saying, watch this. And this is key. What I'm going to tell you right now, this is so key. And if you're taking notes, make sure to put this down. They're saying, not only are we not afraid of the earthquakes, I will not honor the earthquakes. I will not give respect to the earthquakes or the oceans roaring or the mountains crumbling. In, in, in other words, they're saying, forget you. Forget you, earthquake. Forget you, COVID. You have nothing on me. God is my refuge. I don't honor you. I don't pay attention to you. I'm not going to spend my time worrying about you. You earthquake, you mountain crumbling, you, you don't deserve my respect. You don't deserve my honor. Let me tell you, a sickness does not deserve any of your honor, your respect. No, it deserves to be thrown away. And so they're literally saying, not only am I not afraid, but I won't even give it the time of day. It has nothing on me. And this doesn't mean ignoring. This means that for our emotional and mental state, we say, no, I will not be controlled by this. I won't be run by this. I will not allow my life to be determined by this thing because God is my refuge. God is my refuge. It's nice to say it, but the question is, are you living it? Am I living it out? Allowing God to truly be our refuge, our strength, our help in times of difficulty. And so I love what is going on here. Let me keep on reading. And um, th there's a word here that says in the New Living Translation, it says interlude. And uh, in other translations, it says the original Hebrew word, which is Selah. And, and I'm going to um, tell you that word, right? Selah, but I'm going to come back to it a little bit later. And so that comes at the end of verse three. Then he continues saying this, verse four. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. Talking about Jerusalem. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos. Does that sound a little bit like what's going on right now? Nations in chaos. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. And then verse seven, I love verse seven. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. There are two truths right here in verse seven, that when things are going crazy, God, number one, is with you. God is with you no matter where you are. I believe he's with me when I go to the store. I believe he's with me when I go out and about. I believe God is with me right now as I am speaking this message to you. He is with you. He's with you and he's greater protection than anything else that exists. And no, I'm not saying that Christians don't get sick. Of course, Christians get sick and, and Christians get persecuted and even Christians can get killed by violence. And yes, that happens. But do you believe that God is with you because God has called you to live a life without fear or to choose to trust him in the midst of your fear? The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us and the God of Israel is our fortress. That word fortress refused to refuge. It refused to, uh, it refers to a high place, a high place. Imagine like a, a castle up on a hill next to the ocean. And from that high place, they can defend themselves well because they can see the enemy coming. 
and then the enemy has to work uphill while the people in the castle can fight going down, right? And so, so literally what the sons of Korah, the descendants of Korah are saying here is that God is our high castle. He's our fortress up high, our place of protection, our place of defense, our place of winning battles in our lives. How good is this? Verse eight, watch this. Then, then this moves into what we need to do. And here's what I'm going to tell you to do. I want to give you a few tips of what you can do. I'm going to give you three things right now today of what you can do, what you can do to deal with fear. You ready? Here's what you can do to deal with fear. Verse eight is the first one. They say, come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the earth. Verse nine, he causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. So God can bring destruction on the world. He can also cause for wars to end. But, but he starts, they start by saying in verse eight, come see the glorious works of the Lord. See the glorious works of the Lord. One of the reasons you might be driven by fear is because you have stopped to seeing what God is up to. And you're only seeing what the news tells you. You're only watching what everybody says on social media. And you have removed your sight from seeing the miracles of God and the power of God and, and what God does. And, and they're telling us, no, in the midst of mountains crumbling, in the midst of oceans raging, in the midst of earthquakes, in the midst of nations that are in chaos, in the midst of kingdoms that are crumbling, God's voice thunders in the midst of that. And then he says, come and see the glorious works of the Lord in the midst of all of that. Get your eyes off of the earthquake. Get your eyes off of the nations and the kingdoms going crazy. Get your eyes off of all of that and put your eyes on the glorious works of God, the works he has done and the works he is doing. And just, just down about it. Two hours away from us here in Los Angeles, there are groups of believers that have been meeting on the beaches and they have been baptizing people who are coming to Jesus Christ. God is up to something right now. My question to you and for you is what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Where have you placed your spiritual eyes? Are you looking at the messages of the world? Are you looking at the, the works of the enemy or are you looking at the works of Jesus? Because as long as your eyes are on the world or what the enemy communicates to you, you will be driven by fear. But if you put your eyes on Jesus, oh, my friends, he is your refuge and your tower. He is your place of strength. And so when you look at him, come see the glorious works of the Lord. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. And then verse 10 gives me the second thing that you need to do. And it's this, be still, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I love this. And then he says, I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Be still because God is the one that fights our battles. Oh, that doesn't mean that we step back. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that we're not prepared. Oh, no, no. In fact, when the people of Israel many times would go to battle, they went to battle with their weapons. They were prepared and ready to go, but they didn't trust in their weapons. They trusted in God. And many times God would win the battle for them without them having to raise a weapon or God would create a scenario where he would confuse the enemy. And then they Israel came in with their weapons to finish the job, but they didn't even really have to fight that much because the enemy was retreating or running away or confused. 
And so yes, be prepared. Yes, do what you need to do. But will you be still and let God fight your battle? Just like at Jericho, where the people of Israel came and walked around it six days, one time, and then on the seventh day, seven times, they walked around it and they were still no talking, no speaking, but trusting God. And then at the right moment, God told them to shout and they shouted and God took the walls of Jericho down because he fights our battles. So be still. Will you trust the Lord? So first of all, Will you see the glorious works of the Lord? And then second, will you be still and trust God to do what you can't do? To do what you and I are not capable of doing. I don't know if I'll get hit by COVID or not. Up until now, thank you, Jesus. I haven't been. And I take the precautions that are necessary, but I don't live in fear. I'm not afraid of what's going to happen in the fall with our kids going to school or not going to school. I'm not afraid of any of those things because I trust in Jesus. And if I am still and I trust him and I look to him and I go, God, I have seen you do great things. And then I know that here you're going to do another great thing as well. And then this ends saying the Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Verse 11 is a repeat of verse seven. So, so I want you to see something with me so I can get to the third thing that I wanted to say. So watch this after verse three, there was an interlude or Selah. After verse seven, the Lord of heaven's armies is here with us, among us, and he is our fortress. There was Selah. And then after verse 11, at the end, where it repeats the same thing as verse seven, it ends with Selah right there, interlude. Now, what does that mean? This leads me to the third and final thing that I want to share with you today. What does it mean? Selah is an interlude, meaning it's kind of a a break in the psalm, you know, kind of like how we have songs that have verse and chorus and bridge, right? It's a break from one part to another. But in the midst of this, and this is amazing, and I want you to see this, the word selah literally means to lift up or exalt. So so it's, if you would imagine this with me, is, is these descendants of Korah are saying, God is our refuge and strength, right? In verse one, and then we won't fear the earthquakes or the mountains or the oceans. And then they go Selah or in other words, praise Jesus. God, you are good. God, you are amazing. I glorify you. And then they go into verse four, right? A river brings joy to the city of God. And then they go and say, nations are in chaos. Kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. And then they stop and they go, praise God. You are amazing. Amazing, right? They raise their praise to Jesus and, and they stop and they do it. Then they say more, see the glorious works of the Lord, right? And then be still and know that I am God. And then again, the Lord of heaven's armies is here. He's our fortress. And then they end it by going, praise God, your name be exalted and magnified. And that, my friends, is the third thing? Would you see? Would you be still? But would you worship? Do you spend more time analyzing what to be afraid about? Or do you spend more time worshiping God? I start my day every day worshiping Jesus. I spend time in the word and in prayer. And then I sing to God. I worship him. Because there is something about that that is incredible. And I'm going to come to the end of my message now. And I want to give you kind of a a Selah version of a psalm. And and, and this psalm does not mention the word Selah. but, But this psalm in verses 1 to 11 gives you a picture of what God does when we worship him. Let me just read it. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 11. 
I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. And then watch this. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me, right? Starts with praise. And then I prayed and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles for the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his godly people, for those who fear Fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. It starts with worship and then comes to God as the refuge, and then God takes care of us. That is a recipe for a well-lived life. Not fear, but trusting the Lord. Letting him be your refuge in this season and every day beyond this season. Would you do that? Would you choose to see what God has done and is doing? Would you choose to be still and trust him? And then when you choose to worship if you would do those things, you will notice how God does much more to protect you than you could ever do to protect yourself. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we are so thankful and grateful for your words of life to us. And I pray today that you would cause us to truly make a change in our mindset. That's what repentance is, is a changing of our mind that we would no longer look to earthly things to be our source of protection and comfort, but we would look to you, that you would be everything we want and everything we need. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you today recognize your need to give your life to Jesus, then today is a day that you can begin. And I want to encourage you to just say this simple prayer with me, Lord Jesus, today, I say yes to you. I receive your life. Give me brand new life. And Jesus, fill me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to have eternal life in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you have said yes to Jesus today, I want to encourage you in the comments on Facebook or YouTube to put, I said yes, and we will celebrate with you the decision that you have made today. That is all I want to share with you today. We're going to go right into communion right now. So get ready. Let's spend a good time participating in communion together. And remember this, if you are a person uh, that it does not yet know Jesus and wherever you are, if you're in one of our home churches, and by the way, we're starting another home church today and we have more that are coming on. And so if you want to join a home church or start one, let us know. We'd love to get you connected to one. But in our home churches, if you're participating in one of our home churches and you haven't said yes to Jesus, well, right now is your moment to do so. But if you are not ready to take that step just yet, that's okay. There's no pressure to participate in communion, but if you want to, we have open arms ready to go just for you so that way you can participate in the family of God and all that God has for you. All right, let's jump right into our time of communion. God bless you guys. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, for such a powerful message. My name is Yvette. I'm one of the leaders here at City Life Church. And today we will be sharing such a special time having communion together. We all have a seat at the table, remembering what Jesus did for each one of us. First Corinthians chapter 11, it says, This is my body, which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. The bread. The bread is a symbol of the body of Christ. The bread is a tangible element that when we eat it, we remember that we depend on him. We depend on Jesus. And we depend on that sacrifice that happened in the cross. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he has pierced, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. So today, we will be praying for our needs. We will be praying for our needs knowing that the victory for each one of our situations, each one of our needs, the price of those victories was already paid in the cross. And also in that same chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, at the end of that, of that sentence, it says, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. We're not only taking it, thinking of the past, but we are also taking this communion, thinking in the future. We know that we have a future of hope. We have a future of victory in Jesus. So it's the time right now, if you are at a home church, go ahead and pass the bread. If you are at a home, grab the bread for whatever you have it. If you don't have it ready, run to the kitchen right now, grab something that you can have communion with us. Don't miss this opportunity for all of us to remember what God, what Jesus has done for us. So thank you, Jesus because you are so good. Thank you because we have the victory. Thank you for what you did for us on that cross. Thank you because we can depend completely on you. You are the bread of life. You are the one who satisfies not only our physical hunger, but you also satisfy our spiritual hunger, Jesus every single one of our needs, every single one of our sufferings, Lord, or, or circumstances, we bring it to you. And we know, Lord, that we have hope and we know that we have victory. So we ask you, Lord, to fill us up with your peace. And it says here in Isaiah, you were beaten so we could be whole. And we declare that wholeness in every single area in our lives where we can be broken, where we experience in brokenness, we declare the wholeness that Jesus has for us. So let's participate of the bread. Receiving, Lord. We are receiving what you have for us. We are receiving, and as we are ingesting this bread, we are remembering that your body was broken, Lord, that your body was broken so we can be free, so we can be healed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, Pastor Jordan will lead us so we can share the cup. Well, thank you, Yvette, for uh, leading us in a moment where we partook of the bread and also leading us in prayer for our needs. And I'm going to take a, a, a moment and lead us in, in the cup. I'm Pastor Jordan, one of your pastors here at City Life. You know, when I think about the cup uh, of the Lord's Supper, when uh, Jesus instituted this with his disciples, he, he basically mentioned that the cup was, was a symbol of the, his new covenant with us, as well as it was uh, a symbol of... Uh, uh, his blood being uh, cleansing us or being a remission for uh, for our sins, forgiveness of our sins. So wherever you're at, whatever uh, is going on in your life, the blood that Jesus shed on that cross was for our forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins. And that is powerful, that it doesn't matter what you have done or what you, are, what you might do in the future or any sins that have been committed. Jesus shed his blood so that we could be forgiven so that we could be cleansed from all our sins. And you know, you might have problems that you're going through or, or addictions that are happening in your life. And Jesus's blood was shed for each one of those things, for every problem, for every addiction, for every sin, so that you could be free. So why don't you in this moment, as I'm talking, maybe think of one or two things that you know you need to say, God, here is this sin, or here is this problem, or here is this addiction that I need to be set free from. And in a moment, when we partake of the cup, give that addiction, 
give that sin, give that problem to the Lord so that his blood, as a symbol that his blood is cleansing you and setting you free. Because I believe that if we proclaim the blood of Jesus to cover us and, and bring us freedom, it, it will happen because that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. And another thing I think about when, when I partake of the cup is, is when I'm standing there, when I pass away, uh, and hopefully many, many years from now, but I'm standing there before God, and, and instead of God seeing my sins and all the wrong things that I did and, uh, in my life, instead he sees that I've been washed clean from the blood of Christ, that my sin no longer exists because of what Jesus has done and because Jesus' blood literally covers my sin. And so in this moment, as we partake of the cup, put on your mind what it is to those things and, and give it to the Lord. If you need to say it out loud, say it out loud uh, and, and proclaim that, that his blood is setting you free, is forgiving you of your sins, is, is, is covering whatever problems that are going on and bringing about a resolution. So in this moment, as, as we partake, proclaim those things where you're at right now. Father God, I just pray real quick and I say thank you, Lord Jesus, for shedding your blood. Thank you for dying on that cross and thank you for uh, your blood being shed to be our forgiveness of, of our sins, to be the covering over our sins, the washing us clean and being uh, the, the uh, conduits so that we can be free from the things of this world, from the problems, from the addictions that so easily bind us and trap us. So Lord, we remember today what you did on that cross for us. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray, amen. Well, City Life, thank you for joining us today uh, for the service, whether you're on your phone or watching on your TV or, or, or watching uh, this recorded later in the day. Thank you for joining us. I have a couple announcements. First, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we have prayer in the morning. Different people from our church lead it. And I want to encourage you, join us. It's at 7.30 a.m. every morning. It's at youtube.com slash citylifela. And you can find us. And if you want to join in Spanish, it's Spanish is at 7 o'clock. But join us on the Monday, Wednesday, Fridays for prayer and, uh, so that you can start your day with some prayer and uplift uh, and be uplifted. As well, this coming Friday at 7 o'clock, we are having a family Zoom night. We did this before. It was awesome. We played some games. We, we, we got to talk to each other, uh, be encouraged. So join us this coming Friday at 7 o'clock. It's going to be bilingual. Uh, we'll, you'll probably be getting a link to the, to the Zoom call, whether it be uh, uh, through text message or in an email. or uh, uh, you, you'll probably, We'll be posting it on our social media accounts. So look for it there and join us this Friday at 7 o'clock. Why don't I, as we uh, leave here today, why don't I bless your lives? So if you can, where, right where you're at, just lift up your hands at, like you're receiving a blessing and I'll lift up my hand and uh, let me pray. Father God, I thank you for every person that is watching this uh, video today. Uh, I pray your blessing upon their lives that wherever they might be, Lord Jesus, that you would give them strength, you would pour out your life upon them, your health upon them, your joy, your peace, even in the midst of struggle and strife. That Lord, where, wherever they go, whether they, they go to work every day or they're at home or they're out shopping, grocery shopping, Lord, I pray that you would protect them. Lord, surround them with your angels, cover them with your blood. Let nothing of evil come to pass in their lives. But Lord, may your blessings be upon each and every person who is listening to my voice right now. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done today. Bless each, every, each and every one of us. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you, City Life. We'll see you tomorrow morning for prayer or on Friday for family Zoom night or, and, and next Sunday. Take care.